I got into better law schools because I was a CPA. I had more job offers in law school because I had not only a law degree, but I had my CPA. When I studied for the CFA exam, I had such an advantage because of my background in public accounting. So it's a, it's a phenomenal place to begin, but it's not necessarily your passion. Maybe you didn't grow up wanting to be a CPA. Okay, you'll move on and do other things, but you can milk it for a short time and get a return on that investment for all the time you're putting in. Coming to you weekly from the OnPay Recording Studio. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the show. I'm Blake Oliver. I'm David Leary. And we have two rock stars from the CPA exam prep world joining us today. Peter Alinto, global lead instructor at UWorld, and Roger Phillip, chief creative officer at UWorld, Roger, CPA Review. Peter, Roger, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having us. We're glad to be here. I mean, Thank you, Blake. I almost can't believe that I'm seeing you here in front of me, Peter, in real life, because I have you know, seen you on camera, like explaining CPA exam concepts. I feel like you must be probably the most well-known face in the world of, of CPAs, just because we've all seen you. And, and I think the one thing that I really love is, you know, as, as an educator myself, is how entertaining you make uh, the content. You actually make this stuff interesting. How did you learn how to do that, Peter? Well, Blake, thank you so much for the kind words. My mother must have gotten to you before the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. So, no, you know what? Um, actually, I, I, I hate to say it, but I think I adopted a lot of my teaching uh, technique from a uh, bar review. When I studied for the bar, they were some of the most entertaining instructors that I had ever had. So uh, it was like criminal law, constitutional law, whatever property. And like one was more funny than the next and the next. And not only did you appreciate the humor because it obviously made the time go by a little bit uh, faster, but also the memory devices. So I know Roger's great for doing this, but, uh, you know, people, I, I've had people say over the years, you know, they, they laughed out loud during the exam, thinking about something we may have said during the lecture and uh, they were able to recall it. And that's, uh, and really that's the most important thing, right? Getting people to remember this mountain of information. So Roger's actually the, uh, the expert at this in CPE review, I've been admiring him from afar all these years. We were competitors. He didn't know that, but my I have a picture of him in my house. Actually, my wife what? has a picture of him. I'm not sure what's up with that. Wow, and I have a picture of you, so it's the whole triangle <laughs> thing. I love it. I was yep. hoping your wife had the picture of me, not you. Okay, so you guys were competitors for decades. Peter, you were at Becker for like 25 years. Roger, you are the Roger when I think of Roger CPA. Is that right? Yes. I started back in the uh, late 80s. I used to work at Deloitte and Touche, uh, stayed there, realized, you know what, that wasn't my passion. For me, the passion was helping people accomplish their goals. And that's what's given my life a lot of value and meaning. Um, and I always joke, they're like, how did you become a CPA? How did you end up in accounting? You know, you don't have that personality. I, and I joked that when I was in college, I got in line, I thought it said acting and it said accounting, ACC. <laughs> and so <laughs> here I am. But I always figured, you know, if I could use my high energy and personality to help people get through this exam, uh, you know, if you're a smart person and you and you do the right studying, you're going to get through the exam. Our job is just to make it less painful, more enjoyable. You know, the goal is after a long day at work, you don't go, oh, I got to go study with Peter and Roger. You go, hey, I got to study. You know what? It could be worse. Let's go be entertained and motivated. So that's where the memory aids, mnemonics and so on come from. But yeah, Peter and I have been, uh, you know, competitors, fierce competitors for many, many years. So I'm really excited to have him on board. And uh, the two of us together just uh, taken over the entire industry. So, so you've each done 20, 25 years then of CPA uh, exam. 35. Classes, 35. Yeah, I started when I was, I was 10. I was giving you credit. I was giving you credit. Yeah, yeah. A little bit. yeah I started when so, I was 10. And uh, yeah, it's been great. Yeah so, yeah. so in the spirit, I mean, like, and in, we can talk more boring stuff afterwards, but I would love to hear for each of you, like, a, in the spirit of Halloween, right? Like, this is, we're recording on Halloween today. Great. It, like, a crazy CPA exam story about some student or a nightmare scenario, like some, you've had to have seen so many things. Yeah, gosh, let me think about that. Well, I well mean, first I'll tell you, David, to your question about Roger, he, he's being very modest. So uh, he, he does have a tremendous amount of experience. Roger, he, why don't you share, who was your first student in CPA review? He doesn't know why he's too, uh, Moses, Moses was, <laughs> a, you didn't know Moses was an accountant. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, I've got these ten. Oh, ten command. No, um, yeah, we go way back. Yeah, way, yeah. way back. So when he took the exam, now it's computer based, and it was pen and paper before that. When Roger took it, it was a stone tablet and a chis yeah. chisel, chisel like yeah. this. So that's how he put his answers in. But so I'm that's sorry, what was I'm, on the missing. That's what was on the missing tablets, right? When <laughs> when Moses came down from the mountain, it was yeah. just the four parts of the CPA exam. Yeah, there's these eight parts. Well, four parts, but now they're going to six parts. So I guess they must have found some broken pieces from years ago and said, hey, I think we can put this thing together. Um, no, exactly. Um, I, no, I remember always having nightmares about the exam as well, because when I took it, as Peter said, it was 19 and a half hours. It was three days. It was five practice part one, practice part two, theory, law and audit. And you had to take all the parts and you had to pass at least two parts to keep anything. And um it was, you know, and then for a while you had to get us, uh, a, you know, 50% or above in the parts you didn't pass. We had no calculators, so you had to do it all by scratch. And um, and I remember I took it in California and at yeah, USC at the convention center. And I always joke, I took it with, you know, about 6,000 of my closest friends. And you'd go in there and there would be these long tables with everybody sitting in the same direction. And you'd have these, you know, 90-year-old proctors that would volunteer to come in and they would kind of waddle by and drop the exam in front of you. And your heart would go boom, boom. And you said, gee, I should have started studying sooner. And then all of a sudden you just jump into it and... Uh, yeah, you know, you, you couldn't get out of your seat unless you raised your hand. You got a pass to go to the restroom and all that stuff. It was, it was, uh, yeah, it was, oh, it man. was quite challenging. I feel like a snowflake for complaining about my computerized exams that I can take in all separate parts. I mean, now you can take water into the exam room, right? And like one part, it's... And one part at a time. You study for a part, <laughs> take a part. Study for, where in our day, I mean, it was kind of not, I mean, we had to, it was twice a year, May and November. So yeah. you'd go in and take the exam in May. You'd walk out. Now, remember, because I'd be at the exam, the students would walk out. i go, how was it? What was on the exam? And they're like, I have no idea, right? Their brain was like mush. And then you'd have to wait three months. And if you got the small envelope, it was good. If you got the big envelope, it was a reapplication. So, you know, you know, you had the, the people, the arrogant people would walk around the office with their small, oh, hey, how you doing? What'd you get? And then the people <laughs> with the big envelope were like, ah, I can't talk right now. So it was stress. So everybody knew when the results came out, they all came out the same day. It was, uh, you know, it was a, an interesting time. It was an, so all the older partners out there, you remember these stories. Yeah. And Rod, you got the small one, um, the small, you passed all parts, right? First time. There you, you go. Know. Eventually. Yeah. yeah, yeah 27 yeah. years later, <laughs> but you know, but yeah, yeah. I got the small envelope. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. You got, you got. So yes. Yeah, so my horror story is, so, uh, I learned, I learned, I'm a professional test taker. So between, uh, I didn't have enough torture with the CPA, but then uh, the bar exam, different levels of the CFA. But the CPA taught me a very important lesson. So I took it up in Albany, and, and like Roger described, hundreds, if not thousands. God only knows how many people in this armory, whatever it was, rickety tables. And I remember drinking coffee before, and I was nervous. And, of course, I had to go to the bathroom like 10 minutes into the exam, get up, rush to the bathroom. I get out of the bathroom, and I'm like, oh, my God, there's thousands of rows. Where the hell am I sitting? So it took me like 10, 15 minutes, I kid you not, to find my seat again. So I learned my lesson. When I took the bar and the CFA exam, I started to wear a diaper because there's no time to get up and wait to go into the bathroom. So I kid you not, I wore a diaper just in case I had to go. Now, now do you still advise your students to wear the diaper in the exam room? Is that uh, Absolutely. Is that you study official? in exam conditions. So when you go to the library, you sit down four hours uninterrupted wearing that diaper, and you're looking around smiling, and people think you're doing well on your, on your practice exam, but you really just go into the bathroom with that big smile on your face. <laughs> Well, the good news is nowadays it's so you can actually get up and go to the, you know, so they give you breaks between each testlet. Uh, and the first two, the clock keeps running. So I tell students don't, you know, unless you're really cocky and say, well, I'll take it's like running a race like you start and I'll catch up. Don't take the break there. Then after the third, you have the choice. Hey, do you want a break? And they give you 15 minute break. You can get up, go to the restroom and so on. But I always tell people you've got to get back in line to check back in because you take it at a Prometrics testing center. So, you know, you want to be careful. But Peter still wears the diaper. But that's good. <laughs> well, now he's ready for his old age, right? He's it's he's already prepared. Preparing for his That's the difference between me and Roger. I only wear it when I, you know, don't want to get up. He just has to wear it all the time. That depends whatever he's got going on. So it hey, don't hold that against right. me, buddy. Roger, be proud. Be proud. I so, am so very painted a great picture of what it used to be like to take the exam or what the exam used to be. What what is the exam currently? 
before we jump into where it's headed for 2024? The current exam is up until December, you know, the end of December 2023, there's four parts, audit, FAR, reg, and BEC. And the exam uh, generally consists, it's, they're each four hours in length. And as I said, when I took it, it was 19 and a half hours in three days. Now it's four hours in length. You can study for a part, take one part at a time, kind of schedule your studying between that. With the uh, audit FAR and reg, you've got um, anywhere between like 66 and 76 multiple choice questions. And it's broken up into two testlets of multiple choice and three testlets of task-based simulations or problems. And each part uh, has eight problems other than BEC. And BEC is the one that's kind of getting broken up and absorbed into the others, and they're making some new disciplines as well. BEC has uh, multiple choice. It also has some task-based simulations and three written communications or essays, and those essays are disappearing as well. There's also research that's disappearing as well. So they've made changes in that regard. So, you know, when you think of audit, FAR, and reg, those three are still going to exist as what we call the core. And then we're going to have three disciplines of which you choose one. So you're still going to be responsible for four of the six. It's just the first three are the core that everyone takes. It's up to you as far as the discipline. If you pass all four, you're done. You're a CPA. And it won't necessarily state which discipline you took. Um, it's kind of up to you as far as the disciplines are going to be bar ISC and TCP, which, you know, Peter will probably talk more about later, but that's kind of, that's where it is now versus where it's going. So we still have four exam sections for each person. It's just, we get to choose. So really we're just creating a lot more work for you guys to prep us on all the six different sections. That's, that's true. Although, you know, we're not sure yet who's going to choose what discipline because you start a discipline. When you pass it, then you don't have to take another discipline. If you take a discipline and go, mm, I'm not ex excited with IT, let me switch to more advanced tax or let me switch to more advanced, you know, intermediate. Um, so you can kind of, you know, if you take one, don't like it, you can switch that. The God core, forbid you, you switch though. The, the, the goal is to, I think employers are going to have some say eventually as the employers get more familiar with the new format. Obviously, if you're a tax person, uh, it would behoove you to sit for the tax discipline, right? I wonder if people are going to game this, like the way we game everything in accounting. Are we going to just have everybody take the easiest section when they figure out what oh, the easiest one is? Oh, come on, Blake. People want to learn. They're doing this because they're excited to learn. I don't know. Well, actually, I remember... The game even in 2023, Blake. So in 2023, lots of people are sitting for BEC. Yeah, you know me because they want to avoid taking the discipline. So as Roger described... That BEC is going away, and right now, of the four parts, that's generally going to have a higher pass or passing rate, a little bit less information than the other three sections. So people are gaming it in 2023 because if you get BEC out of the way, that equates to one of the three disciplines, which is of an advanced level type topic. So uh, yeah, in 2023, they're gaming it, and I get it. But Blake, I'd like to think going forward, if you were not a tax person, why would you be studying for the tax discipline, right? If you're going to be an audit, you would think either the ISC or the bar. I mean, you would think, right? I mean, if you're a tax person, you've probably taken more classes in tax. So you would think that that discipline would be a little, but isn't this going to help you in your job, Blake? Isn't that the whole reason the AICPA changed the format? So well, it will help you in your career? That's what I want to know from you guys. Do you think <laughs> this is really going to make a difference? Is changing the exam this way going to solve our pipeline problems, oh, get more man. people I, in the I, profession. I, I was at several colleges recently. Roger, get this. I really was. There were there were freshmen and sophomore undecided business majors. And I went up to them and I said, did you know the AICPA changed the format of the CPA exam? Did you know that? Now you get to choose one of the four parts. They were like, you, you got to be kidding. Let's go major in accounting. And then like 800 <laughs> people rushed to the acting. I mean, the accounting line and signed them. Yeah. That's going to improve the pipeline. Yeah. <laughs> no, we, we need to yeah. make it sexy. Okay. You know, like the old movie, The Accountant, with uh, what's his face? He's married to Jayla. The, the Ben Affleck that. movie. Yeah, Ben yeah. Affleck. Yeah. You know, we got to make it. That was my role. I know. That yeah, was and my you, role. Yeah. yeah. Hit, well, hit Peter, me. Peter. Peter, they might do a straight to DVD version at some point when they get up to like The Accountant 3 or 4. And, <laughs> you know, maybe you could stand in for that. Sure, sure. Nobody sees it and then I get the role. Nice. Thanks, Blake. Yes, yes. 
No, but it's, it's, yeah, we, I, I mean, and, and one of the questions you asked earlier, when I took the exam, you needed, you know, uh, a degree, 24 business units in accounting, 24 in business, 24 in accounting, you'd sit for the exam and then you work for two years. And I think that two years was great because you became at least a senior. You got to see a, a bigger picture. So you got that actual practical hands-on experience. Then they changed and said, well, we'll give you an extra year of college and one less year of practical experience. I would have loved to have seen it go back the, to what it was before. Yeah. The problem is all the different states have passed their laws. It's statutory now. It's hard to change it back. So, uh, you know, and I'm so that that's something that's always and I think that also said to people, they're like, well, do I want to take a fifth year of college or do I want to get out and start working? I think that affected the pipeline. So, you know, besides making that change or making, you know, have Justin Timber like do it, get sexy back. We got to make it sexy again and get more people in. Well, we um, just need also, Peter <laughs> throwing the money around on camera go, more. Right, baby. Coffee, Make it right. Right. Also, as the economy changes, one of the things I always tell people is being an accountant, a CPA, there's always a job for you. I mean, you know, as the economy picks up, we need more of us. So, um, I mean, that's one of the good things about this career. And I also tell people, you know, I worked so hard to become a CPA that I'm so proud of it. I'm going to put it on my tombstone. You know, here lies Roger CPA, fully depreciated, right? Because there ain't nothing left. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming He's out. He's a funny guy. Yeah, He's fun a guy. I'm a real guy. fun guy. You, you could have the equation for how to depreciate land on your tombstone. You know, <laughs> there nobody you ever figured it out. So, so one of the arguments in favor of the fifth year of education has been that CPA exam pass rates have gone up. Is that true? And do you think that the fifth year is a reason for that? Because I feel like if, if the fifth year did that, why do we need exam prep courses like what you guys offer? Well, I, I think, uh, first of all, the fifth year initially started out that there were requirements that you take X number of credits that were related to accounting or finance or economics. That would make sense, right? Yeah. But I think that morphed quickly into you could take those extra 30 credit hours and pretty much anything you want. So I, I think um, it's a little suspect, the correlation between those extra classes and performance on the exam. But with that being said, what that fifth hour did provide was that if you could sit at 120, but you can't get licensed to 150, while you were pursuing those extra 30 credit hours, you could simultaneously be studying for the exam. And theoretically, if you chose your electives wisely, which they should have been doing, and you took an extra class in tax or corporate finance or governmental accounting, whatever, it would not only obviously fulfill the extra 30 credit hours, but it would help you better prepare for the exam as those topics are also heavily tested on the CPA. But um, like you said, you know, when people are given the opportunity, do they just take that path of least resistance? Were they really using the extra 30 credit hours uh, wisely in, in the sense of topics that would pay dividends in their career, or were they looking for the easy A? I don't know about you guys. I would never look for the easy A. I would want that hard, advanced accounting class, what I'm looking for. That's why you're you, Peter, right? We all strive to be <laughs> That's you. That's why I take medication twice a day. <laughs> well, and that's yeah. why you started this new thing, you world, which is not easy. It's not easy to start a whole new company. Is this a new company that you guys created together, or was this already existing? No, they've been around uh, probably since about 2001, and they started uh, these two two guys that started the company, uh, incredibly intelligent, ambitious. Uh, one's a doctor, and the other is an expert in IT. And I think he was taking the medical review and realized there were no good review courses, and he scored like the top, you know, 20 or 30 out of 60,000 or some crazy, very intelligent person and said, well, let me write my own course. And then they became number one in medical, then nursing, uh, pharmacy. Um, and then they said, you know, I think we want to keep broadening. Let's look into accounting. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they approached us and we spoke. And, you know, I, I had been doing this for many years. And uh, it's funny because everyone said, what's your exit plan? And my answer was death. So I had no plan on getting, you know, changing. That's the CPA um, way. Yeah. Also. There you go. That's for my tombstone. Yeah. Um, and so I realized, you know, I had competitors approach me. I had private equity approach me. And this was more of a strategic, which I liked because they really cared about exam prep. They really care. I mean, they've they, they've helped, you know, millions of people pass their high stakes exams. And so what I loved about it is they would keep all my people because they didn't already, you know, if I went to a competitor, they'd cut half my staff. I went to private equity. They care about the bottom line profitability and flipping your business in five years. Here, they really care. And they, one of the nice things is they've spent millions of dollars in hiring content people 
and just making the product amazing. I mean, you know, and I always encourage people to shop around, but look at our questions and solutions. You know, we, we get the same questions from the AICPA, we can buy them, and then they give us a letter answer, C. Then you have to write your solution. We've spent millions of dollars on those solutions where they've got the detail. They tell you not only why A is right, but why B, C, and D are wrong. It has pictures, diagrams, summaries. I mean, just by reading the solutions, you really learn a lot. And that's where I think, you know, one of the key differences is, plus obviously having, you know, many uh, motivating, entertaining, high energy uh, instructors such as Peter, myself, and a few others uh, really helps people to stay, you know, like I said, graduated college, you've got, you know, decent GPA, you probably got a job at a great firm. We're here to help make this, you know, two, three hundred hours of prep time less painful, more enjoyable. And so it, it really does help. So that's kind of how we, how I joined UWorld. Uh, they went into bar, they went into CFA, they acquired Wiley. Um, so they brought so many, you know, great resources together uh, that they're taking on, taking over all the online education, um, you know, uh, areas. So it's, it's pretty amazing. So you're making education entertaining, which is really important when, like Peter said, you got to go home after a long day at work at the office and you got to put in those hours. It's got to yes. be entertaining for you to retain anything. Do you yeah. have any advice for candidates who are struggling to maintain their life, their work, their study balance? It's really hard to fit all the hours into the day and get sleep. What is your, like, set up for that? Like how, my schedule, what should my schedule be as a well, first year I, staff? I, the number one tip I have as a professional test taker. So you've heard of Jack of all trades. I'm his cousin Pete. So as a professional test taker, what I found is the more senses you engage when you study, the more likely it is you're going to retain that. All these exams, CPA, the bar, different levels of the CFA, it's the volume of information. Any little piece of the puzzle, not so bad trying to put it all together and retain it for exam day. That's the big challenge. So you know, it's great to watch lectures and to read the text, but having somebody read PowerPoints to you is not is not going to really educate you the way you need it. Um, and also, you got to be at an active learner, right? So you got to occasionally uh, and more often than not put the pen to the paper. You know, I like to make the uh, the analogy is like if you're watching me on the treadmill, that's not going to do much for you in terms of losing weight. You got to get on the treadmill with me. So what you write, you will remember. I mean, Roger tells me all the time when he was a little kid. He used to make these incredibly small cheat notes. He could write really, really small. But then he said rarely did he have to pull out those cheat notes because by taking the time to write it, you're more likely to remember it. Um, obviously speaking it as well. So there are times where, you know, if you have a study group, you know, and you really ideally would like to put two people together with, you know, you're the audit person, I'm a tax person, I'll help you with the audit, you help me with the tax. That's very helpful because when you're educating somebody else and explaining it to them, lo and behold, you're really reinforcing it for yourself. And I always tell people dedication. So you know what? You got to explain to your husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, your significant other that for many, many hours, unless you're a CPA, a doctor, a lawyer, most people can't appreciate, right, Blake? The number of hours you have to put into study, they think, oh, you're exaggerating. You're a boring accountant. I tell people... Let, if they're telling you you're, you're, you're a boring accountant and they're going to find, let them go out and find somebody else. Because after you get your CPA, you're going to be making so much money, chances are you're going to upgrade anyway. But no, <laughs> they, they, David, seriously, they need to support you. In the, I was dating a girl when I was studying for the CPA. She broke up with me because she say on Friday and Saturday, all you do is go to the library. I said, do you think on a Friday night I want to go to, is that what you think? Because I'm hoping on the drive to the library, my appendix bursts so I can go to the emergency room instead. It's not what we want to do. It's what we have to do, but for a short period of time. And stay off those dating sites. None of that hinder, Tinder. Tinder will hinder your performance. Tinder. But should you be out on a date and you want to see, did you find your soulmate? I want you to explain to them governmental accounting, the government funds, proprietary fight. If they're still there at the end of the date, you know you found your soulmate. Or Very somebody's deep. in serious need of mental health. One or the other. I don't know. Hey, well, you know, there's an idea. Maybe you world could create like a Tinder for CPAs. So Ooh, you know, I love right? Roger would be the expert. Did you know he was on the dating game? No, no, no. The uh love, love connection and dating game. Back really? The, How did yeah. you do? I was picked. I was the chosen one. Wow. So yeah, it was yeah. They they picked two couples and a chaperone, and we were supposed to go to the Samoa in the South Pacific Islands. And anyway. It, uh, he was on the same episode. It. He was on the same episode uh, as the as, as the serial killer guy. 
<laughs> I'm not I'm not joking. There was a serial killer in California that won, but thank God the girl sensed right away there was something wrong with him. So she chose Roger Wait. instead. I don't know. Yeah. Serial killer <laughs> Roger. It's crazy. She went with Roger. Yeah. So it was you, Roger, and a serial killer were the contestants. No, we were, it, yeah, it, it, that, yeah. There were. I think at some point he was on. Not luckily, not on my episode. He was, oh, okay. I, not so on so, episode. so these I were the it. choices presented to this poor girl. Here's a serial yeah. killer or a CPA. <laughs> those her choices. Yeah, yeah. I won. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, if I learned anything from watching Dexter, it's that serial killers have a lot of free time on their hands, so they're definitely not CPAs, right? Yeah. No. Because like the- it's it's like you got to set up that room. That's a lot of work. I don't know how he like had a family. And I'm you know once I had a kid, I'm like, how, where does Dexter get all this time? <laughs> so they could learn time management from us. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. No, but getting back to your question too, I always tell people the same thing. Tell your loved ones, I love you. I'll see you in a few months. You do need the support. You need to set up a steady schedule. You need to stick to that schedule. And on our website, we have, you know, you put in your exam date, what you want to do, what part, and we'll kind of help you with, you know, do you want to study two days a week, four days a week, five days a week? And we have all these, you know, with you know, back in my day, um, you know, I had a video camera would film my class. Then I would take the video home. I had 25 VCRs for those kids that don't know. Uh, what they are in my living room and I would copy them and that's the product. I, I became like blockbuster video and would rent You were making my, copies of your tapes on my the, tape. onto the um, In my VHS. living room, this is like a startup story, but I had yeah. 25 VCRs and I had the little master from the uh, cast, you know, the, the uh, uh, camera. And then I would put it in the first one and I, I had, that's how I would duplicate them. You know, and then we went from VCR cassettes to CD-ROMs to DVDs to hard drives to flash drives. And then, thank goodness, the cloud was created. But that's, you know, from 2001 through 2023, that's how we created that. And, and let me tell you how good Roger was. And, and, and I mean this sincerely because technology-wise, Roger, I mean, he would write on a whiteboard behind him, like old school teaching, like, you know, but he was so incredibly entertaining and engaging. And even though he was turning, like breaking all the rules of like, you know, doing a podcast or a, or a video is turning his back, he's writing on the board, the formulas, but that's how outstanding his instruction was and why he was able to build such a successful business and why every competitor wanted him on board, looked to buy his course, the private equity, as you mentioned. But really when you combine that teaching skill but with the technology that you world have, that's why it's going to be a dominant product, really, because the the guy was unbelievable in presenting that information in a way you were likely to rem- remember, second to none. Now, the whole world of like Instagram reels and YouTube shorts and TikTok videos has arguably reduced our attention spans as a society down to like a minute. How are you dealing with that in exam prep when you've got these complex topics? Right? Like, Great how do you, question, how do you- Blake. It's very simple, right? So you tell them when you show up to work to the exam, you might say, you know, I my attention span about 10, 15 minutes. So I'm going to work one task based simulation. I'll do pensions and then I'm done, guys, because my tic tac, tac, tic tac, whatever the hell it is, I'm of that generation. So I got to be done for the day. I'll come back tomorrow and do the, it. Don't work that way. So it's more incumbent upon us today to teach endurance, mental endurance. You can't afford to get, imagine failing this exam with a 73 or 74 because you made silly mistakes at the end of that exam when you were three and a half hours in and you start making silly, you can't afford to have that happen. So great question. Nobody practices for a marathon. You're gonna run a marathon, you don't practice the day before. Months in advance, you need to not only practice the concepts, but also sitting down four hours uninterrupted and concentrating. So today that's so incredibly important. That's why somebody reading PowerPoints to you, forget it. Then you can only sit for five minutes at a time. You know, who wants to watch that? But when you're engaged and it's back and forth and you're writing and you're asked to solve problems and say, okay, look at the way I did it. Now let's do it together and solve it. All of a sudden it's very engaging and four hours flies by like this but you've got to build up me- that mental endurance. And that's something that takes time. The first week you start studying, you might be hard pressed to sit down for a half hour, 45 minutes. But then in the second week, you're 45 minutes to an hour, hour and a half, and it's got to build up so that in your final two weeks of preparation, it's no problem for you to sit down, work a practice exam, four hours uninterrupted and practice your timing between those five testlets, the first two being, as Roger mentioned, the multiple choice, the last three, the task-based simulation. But to sit down for four hours, 
You need somebody who's going to keep your attention. A handsome guy like Roger. Well, you know, one of the nice things, too, is we've taken this, you know, over. I mean, I used to lecture for four hours straight. And then yeah. what we realize is now you're right. The attention span gets shorter and shorter. So we're taking our our lectures and breaking them down into just like six to ten minute bite sized lectures. So you're going through it, seeing it. We're talking about the material, giving you memory aids, going through practice problems. Then with the software that we've created, because back in my day, we didn't have all this technology. Right, we it was had a book and a paper. video, right? Exactly. That was it. Paper. That was it. A you stone walked through tablet and, and a chisel. Yeah. Well, that was your day too. But um, yeah. and now, what well, we have this amazing software that we also found that you know we've got thousands of practice questions, past EPA exams, created questions, and so on that you don't have to do 100 percent of the questions to get a 75 or above. I mean, 75 percent is what in college it feels like a C. That's an average. That's what C stands for, CPA average, right? No, so it's not an IQ test, but it's a test of discipline. If you study, you're going to pass. And our job is to keep you studying. So what we did is we have this software that's amazing where it goes through and it'll say, okay, here's a section with how many questions. Here's what percent you should get right based on our past students' success rate. So it says you don't have to do 100%, 100% right. Maybe you need to do this number of questions. And it keeps track of how you're doing. And it says, hey, you understand accounts receivable, percentage credit sales, aging of AR, direct right. You understand that. Time to move to the next section. Because we tend to spend too much time on areas we understand because we yeah. feel good. Woo I'm getting it right. And not enough on deferred taxes where it's a little trickier. So that's what the software helps to do, which I I didn't have back in my day. It keeps track of how you're doing and says, hey, time to move to the next section. Because, you know, on your certificate, it doesn't say if you got a 99% or a 75%. Both of you are CPAs. Most people just want to join what they call the 300 club, 75, 75, 75, 75. You know, you get a 90, you go, ah, I wasted, I could have partied Friday night. I studied too hard. So the key is that's where technologies come in. That's how we have to compete, like you said, with all these, you know, bite-sized things that are so, but the good thing about having Pete, myself, and the others is we've got that energy. We've got that entertaining, the entertainment value. But we've been doing it for so many years that we know what works to help you accomplish that goal of passing the exam. Yeah, so Blake, it's a it's a back and forth. So it, logically, it makes sense to break it down into manageable subtopics so you can build your foundation, one piece of the puzzle at a time, start with your current assets, work your way up. And then it's a back and forth approach because there's nothing more frustrating than to watch a professor do it. You think you got it, then you go home and try it on your own and you don't even know where to begin. So the goal is to say, okay, we're going to walk you through the subject matter. Now let's practice together. Now you practice on your own. Then you come back and repeat that process. So it's a great way to make it more manageable in processing that information. But the other thing that's key too is that with the, uh, with the software and the technology that UWorld has developed, like we don't force, as Roger was mentioned, we don't force you to watch every lecture to earn a you know, a, a free repeat or something like that. Or so you, why would you work every question? Like Roger said, like once you have it mastered, it's time to move on. So the technology will tell you that. And in addition, you know, there's topics where you might feel really strong. Hey, I just took a class in, a, you know, uh, individual tax. I got an A. Do I really need to watch Peter Wright, Roger lecture on individual? Absolutely not. There are certain topics where you can start with the questions and then, you know what, the software is going to tell you, you're either as good as and proficient as you thought or you're not. And then if you're not doing as well as necessary to pass that, that subtopic, that part of the exam, then go back and watch the lecture. But we don't have a blanket approach that says you have to watch every lecture and you have to do every question. It's dependent upon your level of expertise, you know, your, your, your knowledge. You might have gotten a C. You might have gotten an A. You might have taken that class six weeks ago. You might have taken that class 16 years ago. We have candidates with all different kind of diverse backgrounds. But it's there that you could take it, and no matter what your background is, whether you were a C student or not, you can get through this exam, and efficiently. Exactly. And there's, you know, I remember in college we had electives, and, you know, advanced accounting was an elective, and I elected not to take it. So the only way I was exposed to it was through the review course, which gave me what I needed. So same kind of thing. There's stuff that you're proficient in. There's stuff you've never seen. There's stuff, you know, most of us start college or, or start the semester the same way. We go, this semester is going to be different. I'm not going to fall behind. I'm going to study right away. And you get your syllabus and your book and then toga party, and you forget about studying. It's the night before the exam, and you cram. You take the exam, blow it out your 
your brain. This is the comprehensive final you've never seen in school. And there's stuff on there you may not have seen or don't remember. That's where we come in to review it. We call it a review course, but we don't expect you to know much, right? You know, debits on the left, credits on the left. If we can do that, it's a good start. We'll get you through the rest. Yeah. So thinking about preparing that mental endurance, you said, being able to sit there for four hours to take a test. But I immediately go to the physical part of this. I think you're both gym raps. I think I listened to a... Uh, interview you both both hit the gym pretty hard do you recommend or like is there a guide you tell students what you, what your diet should be how should you be exercising like how do you keep your body healthy while you're studying preparing for the cpa exam so you can actually sit through it successfully david it's funny you mentioned that because you know really i mean most people are pressed for time so whether you're going to school and studying for the exam or you're working full-time going and studying for the exam right time is of the essence so you know, you got to make choices. So uh, this is probably not the time you're going to be putting three hours in at the gym. But, you know, it's good. So you got to blow off that steam, right? So you're going to do an abbreviated version to keep yourself healthy. But by the same token, you know, you can't afford to be in the gym for three hours. You know, you got to, you know, you got to make choices. Like, do you want to smell good or be a CPA? You got to shower less, right? Who has time? <laughs> Half hour. Roger's got to do his hair. There's no time hey, for that. So, P Peter, Peter, I want to know, what, what are your workout routines? How do you get, how do you stay in shape? I, I lift CPA review books. No, I lift Roger. I'm not, you know, I, I got to tell you, for me, my whole life, it's the thing that keeps me somewhat normal. I mean, truth be yeah. told, if I didn't do it, God, I'd, I'd be a dangerous person. I mean, it, it helps me uh, to blow off, I, you know, that, that, you know, a lot of that energy I blow off positively when I'm teaching, but it's a, it's a great release. So it does a lot for you physically, but I think it does a lot more for me mentally than it does physically. Although my wife might disagree. I don't think she does it. It does enough for me mentally. Roger, what about you? What do you do, Roger? Look at look at those pecs. Give me a little, give me a little, flex those pecs. Come on, man. You know, when I was younger, when I was your age, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, it was great because when I was in public accounting, when I started teaching and so on, I would get into regular routines. I go to the gym three times a week and I, it was more on, you know, bodybuilding and getting buff. And, you know, I was single till my 40s. So I had a motivation to to look good. Then as you get older now, married, kids, da, 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 older. So now it's changed to instead of getting buff, it's trying to stay flexible, healthy, you know, blood pressure low and heart rate good. And so you tell try them, to tell who was your personal trainer back in the 60s. Jack LaLanne. Jack LaLanne. I Remember started, Jack LaLanne? I actually trained Jack LaLanne. Yeah. For those yeah. who don't know, he, he lived to be yeah. like 90. Um, yeah. But he, yeah, he would like swim across the channel, towing 20 boats and stuff like that. <laughs> um, yeah, that or Richard Simmons. Um, so, but no, you know, the key in life though is to find things, you know, I still snow ski, I still swim, I still go for hikes. So you, you change as you get older. It's not about, you know, how much weight I can lift. In 20s and 30s, it was about that. 40s, 50s, early 60s, not that I'm there yet. <laughs> but it's just a matter of kind of staying healthy and stuff. I think one of the things too that Peter and I were both blessed with is a lot of high energy and probably a fast metabolism, which keeps it going too. And that's, I think that's important, but, it, but in life, it's important to find activities you enjoy so you can continue doing them later in life. But, I but, would, but getting back to studying for the exam, yeah. I would get up and I would sit down and do 20 or 30 or 50, and you can work up to 50 to hundred pushups pretty quickly, pretty easily. Yeah. And the pushups are great. They're working all Let here. Let me see this you do a hundred push. Who are you kidding? You can't do a hundred pushups in a <laughs> now row. Now I can't, but when I was studying for oh, the yeah, exam, yeah. like And like that big people, fish you caught too, right? Yeah, yeah it right. got away. It got away. You should have seen it. But anyway, we know the point is start with five push-ups. Go you to think you can do? I'll, if you do 100 push-ups in a row, he ain't doing no 100. You never did 100 push-ups in a row. I did. I did. I could. I can do pull-ups. I can't do them anymore, but I could. But these are my point being, you're studying. You need a break. Get up. Do five push-ups. And then, then do seven. Then, And by the time you get to the exam, you'll be in good shape mentally and physically. <laughs> and you'll be up to 25 push-ups and sit up. So those are the little things. And th those are the kinds of exercises that you can carry through. You know, when I was in prison, I didn't, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you <laughs> well, need to do. I help my kids with their homework, their algebra homework. And when they get one wrong, I make them drop and give me 20. That I do do, no doubt. So yeah, if you get a problem wrong while well, you're studying, drop and give me 20. Well, Let's go. That's why if you're their coach, that's why your kids can do a thousand push-ups. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So can you guys do a deal with like Peloton where you have a Peloton and you do CPA review at the same time? This could be, I don't know, maybe yeah, we solve this problem. It, it already comes uh, loaded with uh, videos of Pete. So yeah. we're all good. There we yeah. go. Yeah, we'll work well, that out. So, Peter, you are famous for having this coffee offer. Uh, like, if you pass the exam, I'll buy you a coffee. Is that right? 
You used to do yeah, that. Yeah. So, so, so what I did was when I structured my deal at that other company and with you world, so I, I'm mostly variable pay. So I don't get a big base like Roger. I'm, I'm, I'm a very small base, but I, I, I want that. I, I want to be compensated based upon pass rates and people succeeding. Right. So, uh, so I'm, that's why I'm so passionate to help these people, but I'm really there to help them to help me because without them passing, I don't get my bonus. But if uh. you work hard and you pass and you help me get my burn bonus, I'm going to kick you back part of that bonus by buying you that cup of coffee. That's that's right. my generosity. Yeah. I, I find you are, and I buy you coffee. It's an he excellent example of... Yeah, he bought stock and coffee companies. So yes, it costs some money, but it's a little bit less. So he's not as dumb as he looks. It's incentive-based compensation. It's really smart. There you go. Um, That's right. You, well, so Peter, as a result, you have talked to a lot of young accountants after they pass the exam, also while they're, you know, working on it, but also after you came to my firm when I was in public accounting and did a happy hour and people were coming out and getting to meet you and uh, having a great time. So I'm, I'm wondering, given that you have your ear, you know, to all these young accountants, what are they saying about the profession, right? What because we're losing a lot of them in the early years. They're going into public accounting and then they're burning out after like two, three years and they're not staying in accounting. They're going somewhere else. That's what's happened over the last few years. Do you have any insight as to why that is? Well, uh, if, and first I gotta, I gotta embarrass Blake a little bit. So when I did meet him at the firm and now I remember, he came up to me, Roger, he had, he he wanted me to sign a picture, you know, an autograph. But unfortunately, it wasn't my picture; it was your picture. I don't know what that was all about, but I did sign it. But um, yeah. yeah. So so and it's so still, and I it's tried still to... in his room. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Right, I think it was his bathroom, but it was in a room somewhere. So um, <laughs> no. So when I tell kids, listen, uh, as somebody who's dabbled in different uh, professions, you know. I don't know anybody that's making money and, ex and succeeding at a very high level that that's not cranking the hours, right? Unless you're inheriting money or inheriting a business. If you're a doctor, think about the four years of college, four years of med school, then the residency where you're not making much, you're on call 24 hours. If you're a, a, a new you know, law school graduate, the hours you're, you're cranking. Um, so, you know, accountants are no different. So I try to, first of all, say, you know, it's part of the price you pay for success in general. So I know the reputation, but lots of successful people are working hard. You know, I would teach CFA down on Wall Street. People would come to class six to nine, and then at nine o'clock after class, they're going back to their desk to work. So it's it's not just us, right? So that's yeah, number yeah, one. That's fair. And number two, you know, I, I think you look at public accounting as the opportunity, a big buffet, right? All the different things you should try while you're at this buffet. So yes, they use us. They're going to get a lot of hours out of us. But by the same token, you can use them right in return. But you know what? I want to get it. I want to be educated in all these different industries. I don't know which one I like. If you're an intern, I don't know if I'm going to like audit or tax. I think I'd like to see both. And if I'm in tax, I don't know if I'm going to like individual, corporate, partnership. So you can milk that in return and make that work for you, right? So, um, you know, the working hard and the long hours... Yes, that that does happen, but it's not your entire career. I mean, if you want to get your education, get your experience, and then move on, you could certainly do that. But you will never regret having those three letters. That short-term sacrifice for the hours you got to put in to get your experience requirement pays you back. Your I got into better law schools because I was a CPA. I had more job offers in law school because I had not only a law degree, but I had my CPA. When I studied for the CFA exam, I had such an advantage because of my background in public accounting. So it's a, it's a phenomenal place to begin, but it's not necessarily your passion. Maybe you didn't grow up wanting to be a CPA. Okay, you'll move on and do other things, but you can milk it for a short time and get a return on that investment for all the time you're putting in. And, you know, I always tell students, too, the longer you stay, the more valuable you become, because some people will start out and they're saying, well, I'm, I feel like I'm not getting paid enough compared to my friend who's doing tech and I'm starting at half what they are. But long term, if you're staying and you continue up, it's like that merry-go-round. The longer you stay, the higher you jump out. Some people, I have friends that I started with that are partners at big four firms and doing quite well. A lot of people that started maybe got to senior manager and said, you know what, let me try something different. Maybe they're at an, a smaller firm. Maybe they went to government. Maybe they're entrepreneurs. I mean, I started in public. I had no idea where I would end up. I have no idea that I would be starting my own business and so on, but I never could have done what I did without having that CPA. So I looked at my first few years as an extension of my learning, my extension of my college. So I 
said, I'm not going to sit and think about, do I love it or hate it? Or what are my opportunity costs? I'm going to stay here long enough, get my CPA, and then I'll reevaluate and say, do I, do, do I stay or should I go? <laughs> you know, Mr. DJ. So I decided I stayed a couple of years, three years. And then I said, you know what? Let me try something else. And I was going to just go into, you know, real estate, marketing, man, whatever. I said, well, let me try teaching. And I started and I loved it because I could take the accounting and the acting and put it together. And like I said, helping people to accomplish their goals has made my life to me much more valuable and much more enjoyable and meaningful. You know, Blake, yeah. Blake, I, mean, I think part of the problem, what I do hear though, is the frustration with that fifth year, right? That fifth year of academics. And I think I would love to see that fifth year become more of a work study, right? So that how do you choose between audit or tax if you've never had the opportunity to do both? You know, I mean, just because somebody mm -hmm. loves something, just because Roger's wife loves him doesn't mean every other woman on the planet's gonna love him. I mean, it's very rare, mm -hmm. right? She's unique in that regard. So I think it's important that that fifth year, if it's gonna be a fifth year, right? I, I think it should be a work study. I think quite honestly, there's a value in some additional credits, no doubt. But I, 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 I was frustrated too. Like, you know, graduating law school, I couldn't fill out a summons and complaint. It was too academic. They didn't teach me how to fill out. How could that be, right? So I think if that fifth year was, you know, six months in audit, six months in tax, and you get to sample these things before you have to choose, I, I, I think people would be more satisfied with their choices if they had that opportunity. I, I wonder if... Um... This reluctance of the younger generation to work the long hours to do the grind at the beginning has something to do with remote work, because I feel like it's a lot easier to grind when you're with a bunch of other people, like in a study group, which essentially is what, you know, being in the office at your public accounting firm might be or being in that audit boiler room uh, might be like it's, it's easy to stay 12 hours when you got a bunch of other people also doing the grind. But when you're at home on your laptop and there's just people on Microsoft Teams, it's not the same, right? You don't have that same culture. And same camaraderie, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know, it, yeah. getting back to studying, when I studied for the exam, I studied with a friend. We'd meet at the library, do our own topics, as Peter mentioned earlier. But if I didn't understand something, I would ask him. If he didn't understand it, he would ask me. And the best way to see if you understand something is trying to teach it to someone or explain it to them because they'll say, why, why, why? And all of a sudden you're like, well, that's a good question. Let me find out. And that was also motivating to know that on a Friday night or Saturday, I wasn't alone. And I think that's the same mindset. I mean, especially since COVID, where everyone's, well, let's be remote. And it's hard to get people back in the office. Plus, with the newer generations, it's like, well, I want more of a work-life balance and so on and so forth. And I think the firms are hearing that and trying to figure out a way to do that. You know, they want yeah. to make it so it's, you know, a little bit more balanced. I just wonder, is it possible to create work-life balance when these firms are incentivizing staff based on billable hours? And so it's the people who work the most hours are the ones who rise to the top. And right. to do that, they are making big sacrifices. They're sacrificing their health. They're sacrificing their family life. And I totally agree that it's okay to do that for like six months to a year while you're working on through the CPA exam. But we can't ask accountants to do that and CPAs to do that for their whole careers. It's like that in other in, in you know law as well. I mean, I have a lot of family members that are that are partners of big firms. It's up to you to have your work life balance. Nobody How many cares of them are divorced. You. How many of them uh, are divorced, Roger? Actually, not <laughs> no, not no? you know, not too many. No, because uh, I think they they you know don't get married at twenty one because you don't even know who the heck you are. So that's my advice. So the longer you wait, the higher the probability it's going to last. Right. But I think. It's having a work-life balance. But it's interesting, too, because as I get closer to retirement age, not that I'm going to retire, um, that's the big question is, you know, I have some friends that can't wait to quit working. And I have others that really enjoy their careers and their CPAs, their accountants. They've done things like that. They're lawyers. And they just are parent, even doctors. My brother's a doctor, family, friends. And they're pairing back a little because they don't want to just go to nothing. They really enjoy what they do. So that's part of the passion, too, because some of you are going to get into public and go, this is my passion. I love this. And some of you are say it's not, but I have such a great foundation. Let me now use it somewhere else like I did or like others do. And as Pete said, you have those letters, CPA. It gives you a certain amount of credibility that you have the rest of your life. So I think yeah. it's worth you know, whether it's, you know, the one or two or three extra years to get that foundation. But I said, like I said, for the first few years, I'm not looking at it. Do I love my life? Do I like my job? It's like, I look at it like extra education. 
you know, extra university. I'm learning practical experience. I'm now applying the practical application of what I've studied for the last five years. Now I'm learning more. So now it's helping my marketability, whether I stay, whether I go. Um, but it's up to you in life to say, you know what? I'm not going to work seven days a week. I'm not going to work 12 hours a day. You know, because at the end of your life, it's family, it's friends. Those are the things that really make, but your career too. But it's also nice to have a nice lifestyle during those 35, 40 years of work too. And Blake, the average, I, I, CPA, the average sorry, CPA makes a million dollars in their lifetime more than a non-CPA. That can, yeah. you know, that, that helps you quite a bit. Sorry, Pete. Yes. Well, well, you know, I, I was just going to say that, you know, I think you can help that first or second year burden by not having to work in public accounting and try to study for the CPA exam simultaneously. That is brutal. Yeah. I mean, so you're going from the frying pan into the fry. It makes no sense. You have the opportunity to at least get the exam out of the way, if not all of it, most parts, before you start working full time. This way, you can devote your time and attention to the job, and then it's more manageable than working the typical hours that you would work in public accounting, and then you get a free moment, and then you got to study for the CPA exam. No wonder people hate it the way they do, because it's too much. It's that That's the overkill. That's what's the straw that breaks their back. So do yourself a favor. Get all four parts, or at least three parts, out of the way before you start working full-time, and choose the order in which you sit for the parts wisely. Certain parts of this exam are very academic, and lend themselves well to studying for while you're still in school. So the financial accounting, no brainer. You're not going to be doing an income statement, a statement of cash flow. You know, you're not going to be doing a bond amortization schedule in the real world. So you know what? Get financial accounting out of the way first. And then if you're going to do audit for a living, sit for tax next, the tax core, regulation, because you're not going to see that in practice, right? But if you're going to be an audit professional, well, then you know what? Your work experience and your new hire training will actually make that part of the exam a little bit easier because now all of a sudden this, this analysis and application, they want to get away from just the remembering and memorizing, right? Now your work experience and that new hire training will actually pay dividends two for one with the CPA exam. So there's ways to make this more manageable, you know? And I also think a lot of people waste a lot of time. Like, look, I, I've never been a morning person, but when I've had to study and do and work or whatever, you know what, Monday through Friday, get up an hour earlier, get it out of the way first thing. It's like the gym you mentioned before. If yeah. you wait to the end of the day, it's on your mind all day and, and you've like worked out 10 times before you've even got to the gym yet because you've worked out in your mind. Get it over with first thing in the morning, right? And then, you know what, the rest of you, you feel better about yourself, but yes, as professionals, lawyers, doctors, CPAs, we've got to be more structured. We've got to have better planning. And if you don't plan to succeed, you know, you're going to fail. So yeah, we've got to be more regimented. But there's, I still work six days a week, a lot of time, but I like what I do. I love what right. I do. So I don't mind teaching a class on a Saturday or a Sunday. So if you're passionate about it, it's not so brutal. My brother flew F-16s in the Air Force. He never worked that day. He loved flying more than doing anything else. Like, you know, I, I get it, but it's part of the process and see the glass half full. Yeah. If you don't have such a, pa well, you're making good money, right? There's got to be something about it. It's a great point, Peter. If you love what you're doing, you won't feel like you're working. And I, I wonder if that is really the root of the problem when the staff go into big firms and they're given really boring work and they did all this hard work to study for the CPA exam and get their CPA and here they are auditing cash. Right, but like, that's why I said going but Blake, with the mindset. How are you going to do analysis? How are you going to be a consultant? What are you going to consult on when you've got no experience? Like what? I mean, people make me laugh. Well, like you want to start at the top. Every profession starts at the bottom, but it's not where right. you stay. It's where you start, and little by little, that pyramid you start to build on that body of knowledge. I get it, Blake. Well, I'm just but wondering, maybe part of that like, process. why do why do we have people going into audit who have never actually put together financial statements before and have only learned it in theory? They should be going to work at companies and making financial no more statements. Academics. The fifth year. Let's use that fifth yeah. year and let's have practical application of these skills. Let's like see an it. Let's feel it. Let's yeah. touch it. Yeah. Stop go, reading in the books. Get on the treadmill. Stop go work watching it. The, go work do at it. Nike and help them put Do together it. their financial statements and then go Wonderful. audit Nike at Deloitte or whatever. So the fifth year doesn't even right? have to be in public accounting. Let it be in corporate so they can see yeah. internal audit. Let them see the process of putting the financials together and, 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 and just observing that. It's like, wow, now I start. I, you, for you're me, absolutely right. For me, that no, was the right. most valuable thing was I was freelancing as a bookkeeper while I was studying for the CPA exam. 
And so I got to take everything I learned from you guys and put that into practice in the in the financial statements. I could like make the journal entries and test it out. And like that was hugely valuable. Um, like I, I learned more. Otherwise. Accounting became so much more valuable and understandable to me when I started studying for the CFA exam. And I saw how the finance yeah. people on Wall Street use the income statement, balance sheet, statement of cash flow to determine value, credit worthiness, operating risk, financial risk. It was like it finally dawned on me. Right. What, what's the significance of LIFO versus FIFO, straight line versus accelerated, U.S. GAAP, IFRS? You're right. Maybe that fifth year should be something in the corporate world where you see what it is they have to give to the investing. But why are we doing the audit? To protect who? What do they need protection from? What, are they, what the hell's going yeah. on with these? What are they used for? So you kind of see that big picture. And then when you go into the firm, you understand your role in the SEC, your role in the big picture in capital markets and how you, quote unquote, protect those investors. You're right. But there's got to be that work yeah. experience. Enough with the books already. I right. love it. We are at the top of the hour. We're out no! of time here. No, no, go, go. We've only just begun. <laughs> well, I would Ooh. love to continue this discussion some other yeah. time. Like, let's fix this problem. Let's get people let's working in corporations. Let's Put go. Well, yeah. well, have well, us back and we'll chat some I, more. No problem. I think that's a summary takeaway I'm hearing here is you have the education, you have experience, you have the CPA exam, the exam prep, and they're not working together in concert. And I think if I'm hearing Peter correctly, like they should be accenting each other to help people hit the finish line and become successful. But it feels like they're just in little silos and then people are just swimming around out there. Yeah. Disjointed. It should not be disjointed. If people want to take the best CPA exam review course on the planet, where should they go, Roger? Uh, I would definitely recommend you world. But I tell people, you know, look at our. Yeah, there you go. Hey. Right. Uh, but you'll, you'll see a huge difference. I mean, uh, they put, like I said, they, a lot of the companies haven't really changed or updated the way that they've uh, done their questions, solutions, presentations. We've redone everything from scratch. And as I said, they've invested millions in the solutions, which really helps to, you know, uh, explain why we're doing what we do, why answer is right, but why the others are wrong, and 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 all the technology that they put into the product. I mean, when when we joined forces, I gave them an amazing product. It's so much better. I always joke I was I was too cheap to put the millions of dollars in that they put in. The product's amazing today. Cool. Really yeah, and, and you know what? You shop price. around for the silliest of things, cars, clothing, everything else. We we have all the confidence in the world in our product. Put it side by side. Watch the way Roger teaches pension accounting. See how the, the competition teaches it. Which one's going to resonate with you? And encourage your firms. Choice is good. Yes. Let them yep. give you the opportunity to figure out what is the best course that fits your style of learning. We we welcome that. We're not saying, oh, no, don't let anyone else in. Just just show us. Just make us available. What are they so afraid of? Encourage your firms. Give us the opportunity to put those products side by side. Better price, better product whenever there's competition. Yeah, competition keeps the quality up and the price down. Totally agree. We have been speaking with Roger Phillip and Peter Alinto of UWorld. Thank you both so much for your time today. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much, everybody. Appreciate it. And good luck out there. Yeah, I was a little nervous. Sorry I didn't talk enough, Blake and Dave, but next time. Next time. We'll work out that. <laughs>